Okay, well, why don't we uh, get started? Clearly no longer day one of the program. People are straggling in 9 a.m. Uh, beginning to feel a little overwhelmed, I'm sure. That's good. That's exactly what you should be feeling, I think. This is, I, uh, I can see, quite intense. So if you feel like you're being uh, swamped with work, that's perfectly normal. But as the weeks go by, uh, at least these two weeks go by, I think you're going to catch up and uh, it'll sink in over time. Uh, so my homework is now posted, by the way, uh, on the on the Tweaky, uh, and I'll be available again this afternoon during one of the Q&A sessions, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the uh, questions I've assigned. Um, I also wanted to announce that the uh, White Levy Room, that's the room that the luncheon for the women was held in yesterday. It's uh, overlooking the pond, a uh, nice and bucolic view. So that room is available during the Q&A sessions if you want to work there as well. So I know the libraries have been rather crammed, but there's more places to go than just the libraries. Um, okay, so uh, any questions about anything, any of the parts of the program so far? Um, if not, then uh, I'm going to delve into the second of my four lectures on grid-based methods for hydro, MHD and radiation hydro. It, by the way, it's available for download from this URL. And I believe I've set the permissions correctly this time, so you can actually read the file this time. Uh, thank you for those that pointed that out to me for the last lecture. So today's lecture will be on operator split, or what I would call Zeus-like methods. So I'm going to give you an overview of an, a simple algorithm for doing MHD based on operator splitting. That algorithm, in fact, was invented, or not invented, but implemented in the, in the Zeus uh, family of codes, shall we say. So what does method consist of? There is a uh, several contact in about six or eight, and we've got the rarefaction. There's a little bit of smoothing at the, the head and tail of the rarefaction, but it looks pretty good. But uh, I would say by now that this test is a pretty low bar to clear, that a lot of schemes will do the sod test pretty easily. Uh, and it's, you know, there's a lot more, much more challenging Riemann problems to do, I think, with modern schemes than the sod problem. It's sort of a... Uh, necessary but insufficient, not sufficient test for, for methods. I showed you this double mock reflection. Uh, here's a set of density contours for different numerical resolutions increasing towards the bottom, and a second order, meaning Van Leer piecewise linear interpolation used in the advection step versus third order piecewise parabolic interpolation used in the advection step. And you see how things like this, this jet, I mentioned this test was useful because features of it uh, are sensitive to the numerics. You can see that this little jet that's produced along the wall disappears at low resolution because there's too much dissipation. You, you really only see it when you get to higher resolutions. It sort of is clearer and sharper at the third order method. So you can sort of quantify differences. Let me show you this movie again just because it's, it's fun to watch. And there's one other thing to see with this movie that was pointed out to me. I showed you this movie last time. Let me show it to you again. Let me loop it. Let me fit it to the uh, screen. And let it rip. So here's a movie of the density, uh, reflection of the shock off the wall, the formation of the jet along the boundary. So, uh, some sharp-eyed students noticed the, uh, these little features here. Maybe you don't have to be so sharp-eyed. They're fairly obvious, actually. Uh, what's going on with that? Uh, that doesn't look right. Well, you know, it's, it's not right, but it is right. Uh, what do I mean by that? Okay. The initial conditions consist of a perfect discontinuity on the grid, but the numerical method cannot evolve a perfect discontinuity. It spreads it out over one cell or so. So the initial condition is not consistent with the steady state structure of the shock. Therefore, at time equals zero, the initial condition is the superposition of different waves, one of which is the, origin, is the shock solution that the code evolves, and the other are small amplitude waves that turn that slightly smeared shock into a perfect discontinuity. So at time equals zero, the initial condition numerically consists of a superposition of a couple of waves, not just one pure shock. And those little waves you see propagating away from the discontinuity, uh, you know, and the discontinuity now is turned into the appropriate profile that the code wants to evolve. These things are called startup errors. You can get rid of them 
by just changing the way you initialize the shock front to be more consistent with what the code will evolve. Uh, the fact that they're there is a good thing. It's right. It means that the code's not dissipating in the way. The, the initial condition, I, I told the code, I gave the code a solution which consisted of a bunch of different ways, and the code did exactly what I told it to do. It evolved all those ways at once, and there they are, and they didn't go away. So the fact that they're there is actually sort of a reassuring. Uh, you can also see there's some uh, structure along the shock front. That's because the shock is oblique to the mesh, and I wasn't very careful in how I initialized this oblique shock across a Cartesian grid, and so there's a little bit of noise along the, the front, and that's added yet additional very small amplitude waves here. So when you really dig into the details of these tests, you can see a lot more going on than, than, uh, than you first might think. Right. So, so what you, you first of all should be using a tensor viscosity. So it's sensitive to the divergence of the velocity in all three dimensions at once. And so the appropriate amount of dissipation is being added in each dimensional splitting uh, and this, you know, at, at once. Because in each coordinate direction, it knows that there's a dv dy, dv y dv, v, v, y, or, uh, sorry, dv y dy and a dv z dz as well during an X sweep and so on in the Y and Z sweeps. Uh, is exactly, I mean, again, artificial viscosity is a knob that you can turn. And so there's no one single value that works for all problems. You know, there's sort of a best fit value, but you can always tune it for the particular problem you're working on to potentially improve the solution somewhat. Um, Question? This here? Yes. I, again, I think these are these startup errors, which uh, happen to be show up in this in this contour le level. So if you go back to time equals zero, then the shock would have been over here, and these startup errors would have been buried in that initial initial front. So the, the other one's right there, and you can see it. You know, it, so what in contour diagrams not so helpful because it all depends on what your contour levels are as to whether you see a small amplitude feature or whether it disappears. Uh, there's like 30 contour levels here and 256 colors in the movie, so the movie's a lot more sensitive than these contour levels. Okay, so this, I mean, this is back from the old days. When I was a kid, we didn't have any of this fancy color stuff, you know, and this is the way that you used to look at stuff, is the contour level, that's all you had. So all the tests, this is an old, old test, and all you had was a set of contour levels you could compare to the other contour levels that everyone else was computing, and you always tried to cho choose the same contour levels as everyone else chose so that you could have a head-to-head -head comparison. That was always an issue. People would always choose different levels, so you never see the same things. Uh, but that's all gone away, fortunately. Sorry. Yes? Why are they smoother? Here, you mean? Yes, these... Th these contour parts here? Yeah. yeah, so here you see a bit of ringing, a bit of noise. It suggests that our viscosity was not tuned here to get, the, uh, to get rid of this noise completely. So we've, we've got a little bit of post-shock noise in the solution. So we could probably go back and tune our viscosity a bit more and get rid of it. Now, with a lower order method, a little bit more numerical diffusion, that's gone away. The noise has been damped by the method itself. So once again, we're on this ragged edge of uh, not enough dissipation, but sharper shocks, uh, more dissipation, but uh, not as sharp shocks, you know? You can't have it both ways with these methods, either or. Okay, so that double mock reflection. Uh, another good Riemann problem for MHD is the Brio and Wu test, which is essentially the sod shock tube, the same choices for the variables that uh, density, pressure, and velocity, but adding a magnetic field as well, uh, a magnetic field which has a kink at it at the, at the interface. So the longitudinal field is constant, but the transverse component of the field changes sign across the initial interface. 
So that generates a whole set of uh, different waves that propagate away from the interface. You actually have, and because it's MHD, a much richer collection of waves. Remember in MHD we have three wave families and not just one is in hydrodynamics. So you can have nonlinear modes of two of those wave families, the, the magnetosonic waves. And, and here they are. There's a fast rarefaction in this problem that races ahead uh, uh, in both the directions. There's a fast rarefaction that goes to the left and to the right. There's a slow shock, a contact discontinuity, and then a compound wave which consists of a slow shock attached to a rarefaction. In fact, this problem is so interesting, there are at least a half a dozen papers that are published just on this problem alone, because it turns out this compound wave is a unique feature, which it was argued about for quite a while as to whether it's real. Uh, it shouldn't exist in ideal MHD. It does exist in resistive MHD, and because all schemes are essentially resistive, they add in some level of dissipation, uh, that's why they're stable, then these solutions appear in, uh, in, in uh, any numerical solution that I've seen. You can go to exceptionally high resolution, 20,000 grid points across this feature, and then it begins to resolve into separate discontinuities and not a, a shock and rarefaction. But that's a side. It just shows you how much there is going on here. So there's the uh, solution from an uh, uh, operator split scheme, and here's the solution from a Godinoff method. You can see in the movie how these waves kind of evolve out of the initial discontinuity. Uh, again, this is density in both cases. And at the end, as you might expect, these, these higher order Godinov schemes, they do better in the shock capturing and the contacts. There's fewer cells in these features as compared to these uh, operator split methods. And we've got lots more problems. I mean, uh, I, uh, there is an evolving test suite for MHD codes, and let me give you some examples of some of these. There are uh, the magnetic braking test, which was uh, quite useful. These, this test produces nonlinear alphane waves, and this is a test of whether your scheme can propagate nonlinear amplitude alphane waves. The test consists of, of a, a one-dimensional problem, an x direction in which there's a uniform longitudinal field, and at time equals zero, there's some finite region in which there's a transverse velocity vy. So that launches an alphane wave at the two interfaces, which uh, you know, go, moves in each direction. So here shows the, uh, the characteristics of the alphane waves launched at the two interfaces. If the density of the material inside this region is the same as outside, you get two square pulses of alphane waves that propagate off to infinity. So uh, you basically break, you magnetically break this, this transverse flow here to be equal to the background and, and uh, the two alphane waves carry away this transverse momentum as they propagate outwards. But if the density inside this region here is higher than the background region, then the alphane waves have internal reflections. They bounce off the density discontinuity. They rattle around inside this region. Every time they reflect, they produce a partial transmission and a partial reflection, and that generates stair-stepping. Each one of these steps is another alphane uh, wave discontinuity that's being produced when, a, when the wave is reflected off the internal internal boundaries, the internal density boundaries. Turns out there's an analytic solution for these profiles, and so you can use it as a code test to see whether or not your code can see these profiles. The solid line is the analytic solution, and the dots are the solution from the third order method and from the second order method. Once again, this third order is doing better, keeping these discontinuities sharper. And you can measure convergence rates and so on because the solution is analytic. Uh, rather complicated, but nonetheless analytic. There's a Weber Davis wind solution. It's a pressure driven, magnetized, rotating wind solution developed for the solar wind. Uh, once again, it's semi analytic solution. You have to solve a, a set of nonlinear equations to get the appropriate solution. That's the solid lines. And then you can set this up as a boundary condition in your code. Uh, you can set up this appropriate analytic solution at the interior boundary, use inflow boundary conditions, and just let the flow sweep across the grid and see if it settles down into the appropriate solution. It's a time-independent solution, so you run the code for a long time, let it settle down and see if it comes, relaxes to the Weber Davis wind solution. You can see it's relaxed extremely well, and because it's semi-analytic, you can compute convergence rates and error norms. It's interesting because it demonstrates that hyperbolic solutions uh, of boundary value problems are much better 
than or, you know, solving it as an ordinary differential equation. You see, solving the wind solution as an ordinary differential equation involves these critical points where the ordinary differential equations blow up. And you have lots of problems with shooting methods or relaxation methods at these critical points. And you have to work really, really hard to get the uh, uh, numerical solution to behave well at the critical points when you're solving an ordinary differential equation. But why work that hard? Just solve the PDE. There are no critical points in the PDE. You just set up the solution at the boundary, you let it sweep across the mesh. It has absolutely no problem at all at the critical points. There, there's no you know, special physical meaning to those points in the, in, the, in the hyperbolic equations, and it just relaxes nicely and quickly. So actually using the time-dependent codes to solve stationary problems is actually uh, quite a good way to go for in many circumstances, a lot easier. And there's even a two-dimensional time-dependent analytic MHD solution. Uh, whew, that's amazing for... Uh, uh, due to B BC low for coronal mass ejections. Uh, so it's in spherical geometry. It shows a, a magnetic bubble which is ejected. Uh, uh, so and there's appropriate boundary conditions to apply at the surface of the sun here as it's supposed to represent. So the, the solid lines here are density contours and these circles are the magnetic field uh, projected onto the, onto the poloidal plane. And uh, so you can set up the initial conditions and let it evolve and once again compute errors because the time evolution of this solution is analytic and so you can compare it to the analytic solution to compute conversions rates and so on. So uh, I could go on and on and on with tests and I will next time with Athena, but those are the ones from uh, the upwind methods. I mean, I really haven't talked about a code yet because, I mean, hopefully you've understood the method to the point now that you could go away and implement this yourself in your own code. I mean, implementation is a separate issue than algorithm. I've described an algorithm which falls straightforwardly out of the original methods we talked about for, for uh, linear vection equations, uh, operator split algorithm, which is quite simple and conceptually easy to understand, and you should hopefully be able to go away and implement it. But, and now, but you don't have to because it, there's a bunch of codes that have this algorithm in it. And uh, for example, Zeus. And there's many, many flavors for Zeus now. If I, if I got this history right, I, uh, I hope here, uh, starts with Zeus 05, which was the very first version of a code called Zeus. I think David Clark coined the name Zeus. Uh, and uh, Zeus 05 was a, a code written by David Clark or modified by David Clark from Mike Norman's original hydrodynamics code uh, that he'd been using back in his thesis days and his uh, uh, research before that. So Zeus 05 was sort of the first incantation of Zeus. Then Zeus 2D was the next version in which we put in constrained transport to do the MHD, the covariant differencing formula, so you could use any curvilinear coordinates you wanted, put in self-gravity, and this full transport radiation hydro, which I'll talk about in the fourth of my lectures. Uh, then there was a 3D extension of that by David Clark, really a 3D extension of Zeus 05, because the way that this Zeus dash 3D works is very much the same as Zeus 05, but it did use CT, and there's a web page where David still supports this code, and you can download it. Uh, and then there, I have a 3D extension of my 2D, so <laughs> now we're going to get confused because there's another 3D Zeus, which is not the same as Zeus dash 3D, and uh, you can download a version of that from here. Uh, you know, we didn't mean to do this, but you know, it's impossible to stop sort of the propagation of different versions, and it's just the way it is. Uh, there's sort of a much more comprehensive and complete version that's being put together by, by uh, Mike Norman at the LCA called Zeus MP2. It's an extension, I think, of this Zeus 2D method 2 3D using CT and all sorts of other bells and whistles, and there's a Again, a URL where you can download the code, but then... And it's parallel. And it's parallel, absolutely. The MP uh, stands for many things, one of them being uh, multiprocessor, I guess. Uh, uh, it's parallel, exactly. This, this is also parallel, but not MPI parallel. And this, I think, is also parallel, but not MPI parallel. And then finally, there's other versions of Zeus MP uh, that, are, that have various bug fixes to Zeus MP v1.5, uh, in fact, interestingly, if you Google Zeus MP, that's not the version you get. You get this version here. So the most commonly used, I guess, or visited website for Zeus MP is this one here, which, which uh, has been developed at the University of Maryland. Uh, they, uh, students uh, 
have uh, fixed some bugs and, and they've, uh, you know, quite, uh, we should be thankful that they have put their, their updated version on the web and allow, allow anybody to use that too. So by now, there's many different flavors uh, of this code, Zeus, but it's just one incantation, one implementation of these operator split algorithms. And there are others as well. They're all written in Fortran. Uh, full disclosure, the versions I wrote used a C precompiler to allow macros that control the physics. You've got gravity, MHD, hydro, different coordinates. How do you turn these on and off in the source code? The easiest way is to use ifdefs uh, using CPP macros. But Fortran 77 didn't have precompiler and didn't have macros. So we just used the CPP precompiler to turn the Fortran source into uh, something that, uh, you know, was specific to the problem at hand and then used the Fortran compiler for that. It results in non-standard code using, for example, .src files instead of .f file extensions. And, uh, and, I, and, you know, Brian Kernigan would probably roast me for doing this and I probably would roast myself. I would never do this again, I think. At the time, there wasn't a whole lot of choice. Uh, because if we wanted to do it in Fortran, there really wasn't any other better way to do it. But today, I would never do it this way. I would use a modern language that allows these macros and ifdefs and not have these uh, non-standard file extensions and so on. There's various parallelized versions with OpenMP. There's the MPI parallelized version, as Mike mentioned, Zeus MP2. There was even a version that worked on the connection machine using CM Fortran. It worked great. The connection machine was a great machine. Uh, very much like GPUs, actually, but with a decent compiler that did all that memory management for you. Uh, but it's a long gone away, so this version is not even available because I don't think you can run it on anything. So uh, how does this compare to, so, so how does Zeus compare to modern methods? I mean, we've described a simple method. Is it something we should just forget about? It is an accident of history. Should you no longer worry about it? Well, we can, com we can ask, answer that by comparing Zeus to a more modern method like Athena, a fully upwind method like, like Athena. And I'll describe how Athena works uh, starting today and in the next lecture. Uh, you know, which code is better? Well, I mean, Athena, of course, because I spent a lot of years developing Athena now, and so I think it's better. Whether it is or not, I don't know. I'm going to say that because all the work I've invested in. But, uh, and, and can we be more quantitative in that? I mean, seriously? Uh, well, yes, and I'll, I want to show you, first of all, that Zeus is not hopeless for MHD. You may be aware of a paper by Sam Fall that quite rightly pointed out that an off-the-shelf version of Zeus didn't get some uh, 1D Riemann problems correct. It turns out that that's a red herring uh, that I, th I think anyways, and that uh, it's very simple to tune the viscosity parameters, for example, and get all the 1D test problems that are in that paper correct using Zeus. But moreover, we can use applications uh, which involve Athena and Zeus to compare the methods, and I'll show some results of that. But first of all, uh, David Clark on his web page shows tests of his version of Zeus, Zeus 3D version 3.5, for all of the tests that are in this paper by fall. So for example, there's a rarefaction test problem, a rarefaction shock problem where the original version gave discontinuities for what should be a smooth rarefaction. By simply modifying one of the artificial viscosity parameters, you get the appropriate smooth solution. Um, also turns out, there's a, for the experts, there's something called consistent advection in Zeus that's also problematic for some of these tests. If you just turn off consistent advection, you also can improve the solution on many of these tests, and in fact, basically fix the tests. The wrong jump conditions problem that Sam Fall talked about is fixed by using a total energy option in, in, uh, in uh, Zeus that's available in, in many versions, in particular uh, David's version. And so you can see all the results at, on David's webpage. So that's not an issue. Zeus can do whatever 1D problems you want to throw at it, it seems. Um, David has done all of the Ruin Jones test suite, for example, all the MHD Riemann tests that are in Ruin Jones. But what about on real applications? Because that's what we really care about, not 1D tests. How does it do on real applications? Well, here's a good one. A comparison of supersonic MHD turbulence. So, so take a periodic box with a uniform magnetic field and drive turbulence using velocity fluctuations that have certain characteristics, some power spectrum in Fourier space that's peaked at some particular wave number k peak, some energy input to the velocity fluctuations delta v. That's constant in time. E dot's a constant. 
Don't add net momentum in the fluctuations, just add random fluctuations with no net momentum and make the perturbations incompressible so they're the least dissipative possible. They're basically sort of alphane wave-like uh, uh, perturbations. Drive this every few time step with a completely new realization of the random amplitudes of these Fourier modes. So it's completely uncorrelated in space and time. And Mike showed you some pictures of well, the results from that. You can study, this is a, an application, studying the properties of supersonic MHD turbulence in molecular clouds using these kind of problems. Here's a weak magnetic field, beta 1. Here's a strong magnetic field, beta 1. Beta is the ratio of uh, gas to magnetic pressure. Uh, and you can see how the properties of the turbulence just visually change. The density fluctuations become anisotropic in the strongly magnetized case. And the turbulence, the power spectrum of the turbulence is anisotropic. And so there's lots of applications and results uh, in, in papers by my student and by many other papers and who've done, uh, you know, studies of this. In fact, uh, uh, you know, this problem has been studied for 15 years or so, originally using codes like Zeus. And, uh, and there was a concern that maybe some of the results were not correct because Zeus was too dissipative. So this is a chance to check that once and for all. So when you run this problem now, with various numerical resolutions up to 512 cubed. Now, this is using Athena. You see that the solution, the amplitude of the energy in the turbulence as a function of time, quickly saturates and becomes constant. And that, it, that the level of saturation of the turbulence, which is a measure of the dissipation rate in the shocks in the turbulence, that converges numerically. That as you go from 32, 64, up to 512, you see that there's virtually no difference between the 256 and 512. So it converges, probably by 256, actually. It looks pretty good by 256. So we have a converged numerical solution here. And we can now ask, does Zeus and Athena give you the same converged numerical solution? And the answer is yes. Uh, here is the blue line shows you the Athena result, and the red line shows you the Zeus results. And by 256 cubed, uh, the, uh, the results are extremely similar. And, and in fact, they're converging to the same value within a fraction of a percent. So, so we find that the amplitude of the tur turbulence predicted by Zeus is similar to Athena. Now, Athena converges faster. So the 128 cubed is at a higher amplitude with Athena than with Zeus. So there's slightly less dissipation in Athena with Zeus. So Athena is converging faster. You need less resolution to get the converged result, but you get the same converged result. That's the key. The codes give you the same answer for this three-dimensional, you know, supersonic turbulence problem, which is uh, very reassuring. Another good application for which Zeus has been used a lot is uh, the MRI. Here's a little movie of. Uh, of the angular momentum, angular velocity fluctuations in a two-dimensional calculation of the MRI. So we've taken a small little poloidal patch of an accretion disk. We're solving the MHD equations in this so-called local shearing box frame. There is a, uh, the MRI is present. We're using a magnetic field which has no net flux. The magnetic field strength varies as the sign of the radial uh, uh, position, so there's some regions where the magnetic field is up and some regions where the magnetic field is down and the integral across the whole domain is zero. There's no net flux. And in two dimensions, in that situation, you cannot sustain MHD turbulence. There's no MHD dynamo and so the turbulence must die away in this case if you wait long enough. And so what you see is the transition from the linear regime of that instability to turbulence, which then dies away over time. The amplitude decays away. This has been computed with Athena using a third order reconstruction, and we'll get to some of those, what those parameters mean in a little while. But the point is that the rate at which it decays in the nonlinear regime depends on the numerical dissipation. So here is the time evolution of the poloidal magnetic energy. There's this exponential growth of the poloidal magnetic energy associated with the linear regime of the MRI. It then saturates and then decays away in time. And the slope of the line after saturation depends on the numerical dissipation because the field's being tangled up and is reconnecting by numerical effects. And the higher the numerical dissipation, the faster it decays away. So as you increase the resolution from 64 to 256 squared, you see with the solid lines, you get a shallower slope, just what you would expect. You're decreasing the numerical resolution or numerical dissipation. 
But moreover, when you compare the solid lines, Athena, to the dashed lines, Zeus, you find that qualitatively you're getting exactly the same solutions, and quantitatively you're finding that Athena is a little bit less dissipative than Zeus, a factor of, say, 1.5. That is to say, the Zeus 64 squared lies, or sorry, the Athena 64 squared lies in between the Zeus 64 and 128. It's a little bit better than 64, but probably not as good as 128. So sort of a factor of 1.5 per dimension. So with 1.5 per dimension fewer grid points, you get the same accuracy solution with Athena than you do with Zeus. So overall, Athena is more accurate, but on the other hand, Zeus is perfectly reliable. So uh, I, think, I still think it is a useful tool. Uh, it has some good properties, like it's very robust. Unlike Godinov schemes, which tend to be much less robust at very low beta, and if you're doing special relativity at very high gamma, uh, Ver Zeus tends to be very robust. Uh, it's very, very fast, probably 10 times faster than, than uh, equivalent uh, or, or comparable Godinov schemes. Uh, I shouldn't use the word comparable. 10 times faster than Godinov schemes. Uh, it's easy to extend self-consistently with additional physics, and there's many versions like Zeus MP. The MP stands for multi-physics too, I think. There's lots of physics options in those codes, which has been added self-consistently. I mean. Uh, when you add extra physics to higher order Godinov methods, it's usually done in a way that destroys the formal accuracy of the method. So you may say, well, why bother? Why take this beautiful, lovely method and then shoehorn in some extra physics that just destroys the formal accuracy? Well, sometimes actually, uh, you know, formal is the key word here. We don't really care what the formal accuracy is. It can still be better. It can still be more accurate to take this high order Godinov method and put more physics into it, even if you're formally making it only first order accurate in time. But on, on other cases, that's not true. You've basically compromised the method, and there's really no reason to be using a very expensive uh, high order method when you're putting in other physics that are, that are more important. It's got all these different grid, grid coordinates. The disadvantages is that it, uh, to be honest, it has pretty poor dispersion relation for compressive waves because you're using this finite differencing for the pressure terms and the uh, upwind advection uh, split off from that, uh, which are also important for the pressure waves. So it has a much worse errors for the uh, compressive waves than do unsplit methods. It doesn't use the conservative form, and it doesn't have an AMR version, uh, although it does have this non-uniform grid, which is better in some circumstances for some kind of problem. So, uh, well, I'll get... The bottom line is I think that uh, Zeus is perfectly good code for many applications. On the other hand, it's not the most accurate method and it uh, doesn't work with AMR. And so in the, you know, I think for the future, uh, there's lots of development and, and interest in these Godinov methods. Okay, well, let's, let's move on from these upwind methods. And my last uh, 15 minutes or so, I want to talk about other techniques. Now, in and I only got really one more lecture to go on MHD before I do rat hydro, and I'm not going to have time to cover all the other kinds of methods there might be. I can only focus on one. But I did want to at least point out that there are many other ways to solve the MHD equations on a mesh other than operator split methods. So, I mean, now we know one method, operator split. But you could also just use finite differencing everywhere. Don't use that upwind conservative advection techniques, just use finite differencing even for the advection terms. In that case, you're going to have to add a hyperviscosity to make it stable, and uh, I think the pencil code is the best example of that. Um, there's so-called central schemes, which we know was an example, uh, the finite volume methods, which I'll be talking about, so I'm going to be sort of talking about these finite volume methods next. There are spectral methods, which is another whole class of method which is especially suitable for incompressible flow and, uh, you know, give, give you spectral or, uh, accuracy. Uh, you know, they, they're uh, extremely accurate uh, for incompressible flows. And there's even lattice Boltzmann and particle methods that are, are available as well. And since my talks are supposed to be on grid codes uh, five and six, I, I don't have to say any more about it. I tried to think of all the public codes that I could that uh, you could sort of download right now if you wanted to, to do MHD. And this was the list I come up with. There's the higher order finite difference methods like pencil. There's operator split with artificial viscosity, Zeus. And the original versions of this Nirvana code were based on the same method. Godinov schemes, there's a bunch. Uh, 
In addition to Athena, there's Ramses I know of, Pluto, the versatile advection code, Bats Are Us, which is used in the space physics community a lot, uh, and Flash 3. Uh, important to use the Flash 3, I think, because it's got important updates to the MHD algorithm in the latest version of Flash. And then there's a new version of Nirvana, which is really based on central schemes as well. Now, have I missed anything here? What, what codes do you know about that I don't, that I've just forgotten about? I mean, I'm trying to make this comprehensive, so if there's anybody can think of anything that should be here. Yeah, there's one there. Uh, Cosmo++, plus. Co Cosmo++, plus plus. good point, yes. And that's publicly available? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to restrict this to MHD, because if I make this hydro, there will be many, 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 many more codes as well. So this is just MHD, and I know Cosmo++ plus plus is an MHD code too, so you're right. Let me try to add that before I'm done. But I hear another one, did I hear? Another code here? Which one? That's correct. That's, uh, well, that's, that's GRMHD, so, uh, but, but we shouldn't discount it because it's even better. You know, it does even more physics. You're absolutely right. Harm is another one. Thank you. I should have remembered that one. I'm sorry, Charles, if you're listening. Any, any other? Okay, well, I don't feel so bad if I only missed two, Cosmo++ plus plus and Harm. The point is that, and oh, by the way, where would they fit? I think, if I'm correct, Cosmo++, plus plus would, that would fit in the operator split methods, I think. It's, is it, no? Okay, is it a, okay, well, I, I won't say any more about it because I'm just revealing my ignorance. Uh, but Harm, I know for sure, is a Godinoff technique. Uh, so I will add those to the, uh, to the list here. So the, and the point is, lots of codes for you to, to look at. And uh, also, you can see that the community clearly is interested in Godinoff methods nowadays. That's where people's interests, I think, now are in, in, is in Godinoff methods. So we'll focus on Athena. And we're going to start with the discretization. There's uh, many other codes take this approach. I don't want this to be too Athena-centric. You know, there's lots of other w implementations of similar ideas. I just want to tell you how Godinov <coughs> schemes such as Athena work, uh, and more information at that URL. Uh, why do we even want to do this? Uh, because we really want to use, I mean, why do I want to do this? Because I want to use nested and adaptive grids, and they work best with single-step Eulerian methods, and I want to study very thin, geometrically thin accretion disks, and the only way I can resolve the MRI in the in interior of a geometrically thin accretion disk and do a global calculation that spans many, many scale heights, I think, is to use a nested grid. I don't necessarily need adaptivity, but I need a nested grid. Uh, and also, there's an interest in just exploring more accurate methods than what are in Zeus. Zeus is 20 years old now, and so it's interesting to explore more recently developed, more accurate methods. And why adopt these good? Why are good methods so popular? because they're extremely good at shock capturing and for discontinuities. And for many astrophysical flows, that's what dominates the global error, is the discontinuities in the solution. They can be made strictly conservative, which is great for static and adaptive mesh refinement, because you have to enforce conservation across fine and coarse grid boundaries in the interior of the mesh in order to prevent spurious reflections off the grid. So you really need a conservative scheme in order to do those flux corrections. And they don't uh, require, I mean, Godinov methods are often criticized because they're so expensive. You have to have, quote, unquote, a complicated Riemann solver. But you don't, actually. You can run a Godinov method with whatever Riemann solver you want. You can use a Lax Friedrich solver or an HLL solver if you want, similar to what are used in other methods. Of course, the solution accuracy will be compromised. You get a better solution if you use a better Riemann solver. And so that's why people use expensive Riemann solvers, because it makes the solutions more accurate. But you don't have to do that. So that's not an argument against using Godinoff methods. The fact that it needs a Riemann solver is not an argument. And I've listed a whole pile of papers just to show you the developments that have been made. I mean, there's many, many people who have contributed to the developments of these MHD techniques. And these are papers that are just method papers on how to do MHD with Godinoff methods. And you can see there's quite a long and significant set of contributions from many, many people. So how does the uh, basic, let's just set up the discretization here. We're going to start with a fresh piece of paper. You know, forget what I just told you about how to do MHD with operator splitting. Let's start again. And let's start with 
the, even the equations written in a different form. We're going to write the equations now in conservative form. So now they're all time derivative of conserved quantity plus divergence of a flux is zero, except for the induction equation, which we're going to have to treat separately once again, because it's, it's just different. Um, we're going to have to use something different for the induction equation. We're going to have to use finite areas. But the equations involving divergences suggest using finite volumes. So we start by, once again, the discretization. You always start with the discretization. You stick the density, total energy, and momentum at cell centers, and you treat those as volume average quantities. So it's the integral of the, the uh, true solution over the volume divided by the volume of the cell. The magnetic field, however, we're going to stick at cell faces and we're going to treat area average components at cell faces. Here's one difference right away, because not all Godinov methods do that. Many of the Godinov MHD methods use cell-centered magnetic fields. But I'm going to argue that cell faces is much better and is the natural discretization for the induction equation. And yes, it's more complicated to program because you've got a staggered mesh for the magnetic fields, but the benefits outweigh the disadvantages. And so we're going to be following a staggered grid for B. OK, so notice that this is different because we stuck the momentum at cell centers. Before, the velocity was at faces. Now everything is at cell centers except for the magnetic field. And then there's just a little bit of you know, formal mathematics, and th you know, that's, that's all there is here. You can write the conservation laws, as we saw last time, uh, as uh, you know, in this divergence form. Time rate of change is the divergence of the fluxes. I've assumed Cartesian coordinates here, so I've expanded the divergence operator in Cartesian coordinates. If I integrate this equation over the volume of the cell and over a time step, uh, I get this following equation here. I get that the solution at the advanced time is the solution at the old time minus the difference of the fluxes at the cell faces. And this is exact. There is no approximation that has been made here because it's exact because I have defined these cell average quantities in integral form and I've defined these fluxes as the time integral uh, of, of these functions f, g, and h, which are, of course, functions of time here. So what do I mean by that? I mean that my definition of u is that it's the integral over the cell of u itself, and the definition of these fluxes at n plus a half, it doesn't mean to say the flux evaluated at time level n plus a half. It means the integral of the flux from tn to tn plus 1. This is the time average flux over the time step. So substituting these definitions back in to this equation here, I would get exactly, uh, analytically, this, this equation back again. I get back the, the actual analytic PDE. So there's absolutely no approximation in writing this difference formula as long as I keep in mind what my appropriate definitions are of volume averaged and uh, area averaged fluxes, area and time averaged fluxes. Similarly, the induction equation I don't do a volume average on. It's much more natural to do an area average, as I already showed you before. I do an area average of the magnetic field, and when I integrate the curl operator over an area, it turns into a line integral around the edges, and so my discrete form for the magnetic uh, induction equation is that I have the time, you know, the advanced time is the old time plus line differences, or differences of the electric fields along the edges of the cells. Uh, and again, this is exact. There's no approximation as long as I keep in mind that the magnetic field here is defined to be the area averaged field. So now it's only a double integral, not a triple integral, only the, over the area of the, uh, the transverse area uh, normal, uh, you know, compared to the normal component of the field on that face. And as well that these electric fields E, these EMFs, are not evaluated at time level n plus a half, but are rather the integral over the time step tn to tn plus 1. So these are time averaged and line averaged, integral along one component, one edge of the cell. Again, if I substitute this back into the finite dis difference form for the induction equation, formally I get back the original PDE. So again, no approximation has been made here. This is exact. But so far, all we're doing is sort of formal mathematics. Uh, 
So to, hopefully uh, that was clear, and if that wasn't, hopefully this makes it more clear. See, I have a vector u of cell center quantities, that's density, momentum, and total energy. I have magnetic field components, bx, by, bz, at cell faces, so that's the discretization. And then I have the fluxes. The fluxes of u are located at cell faces, f, g, and h, for the appropriate x, y, and z faces. And then I have the fluxes of the magnetic field, which are the electric fields, at the edges of the cell. And again, these are time averaged the, uh, over the time step. The fluxes are area averaged, and the electric fields are line averaged along the edge of the face. But uh, right now, a sort of you know, mathematical gymnastics, because it's all well and good, but how do I compute F, G, and H, and how do I compute the electric field? If I know how to compute these fluxes and these electric fields, I'm done. Because I substitute them back into those difference formula, I have an exact update, and it's exactly conservative. The whole heart of the method, the entire you know, effort goes into how do you calculate those fluxes and how do you calculate those electric fields. So of course, I'm going to stop there and not tell you how to do that. Uh, I, you'll have to come back on Monday, and I'll tell you how you calculate the fluxes and the electric fields. Uh, so here's my overall summary. Uh, there's, uh, this Zeus is still useful, but Athena is the future. That's, that's my bullet to take, my takeaway bullet. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>